the same fistula being visible on a coronal section. Again, that's the lateral semicircular canal, that's the vestibule, that's the basal turn of the cochlea, that's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, and as you can see, the bone over the uh, lateral semicircular canal is pretty intact, whereas again, the pathology over here has eroded the bone and has made a fistulous communication between the uh, pathology and the lateral semicircular canal. Now, take a look at this slide properly, and then concentrate on the next slide. The difference that you see here and in the previous slide is the fact that if you look at the shadow within the vestibule or within the labyrinth, you find it to be an iso-intense shadow. Are we clear on that? Am I correct? But if you look at this particular slide, what you find is, I'm not sure whether you're able to appreciate because of the contrast or not, but there's an iso-intense shadow here and here which means that not only is there a fistulous communication, but there's a pneumo labyrinth. Now, what is your option, or rather, how do you interpret that? If there is only a fistulous communication between the pathology and the bony semicircular canal, then you, might, you usually don't land up with a pneumo labyrinth because the membranous labyrinth is still intact. But a pneumo labyrinth within the semicircular canal would possibly give you an idea that there is a fistulous communication which is involving the membranous labyrinth also, or in other words, the membranous labyrinth is also open to external air. And so, if you encounter a numerous pneumo labyrinth, your prognosis as far as hearing is concerned goes down. Obviously, this patient would be having some kind of a sensory neural hearing loss, but then you have to keep this in mind while counseling the patient as well as while planning your surgery. Okay, that's uh, the, the fistulous communication between another semicircular canal. That's the superior semicircular canal which you see here on a normal coronal section, whereas you can very clearly see that this pathology here has not only eroded the tegmen, but it has moved on and created a communication with the superior semicircular canal as well. So while lateral semicircular canal fistulae are more common in day-to-day -day practice, don't don't sort of limit yourself to the fact that there can only be a communication with the lateral canal because it's the lateral most or the outermost structure. That's one of my favorite slides. That's the basal, the, the two or the two and a half turns of cochlea very clearly visible on a coronal section, normal coronal section. And the, that's a petrous bone cholesteatoma which has eroded into the base of the uh, basal turn of the cochlea. Again, with this kind of an appearance on a scan, you really need to figure out whether you would be going in for a routine mastoid surgery or would you think of a petrosectomy with a cul-de-sac closure in case the patient has, has totally or more or less having a severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss. Right. Our friend or foe in the temporal bone area, and that is the facial nerve. The moment we open the, pa the patient till the moment the patient is back from anesthesia, the only, the main area of concern is, boss, facial nerve cheek, hai na? I hope I have not messed up with the facial nerve. So it's extremely important that we understand the anatomy of the facial nerve and we visualize it beforehand in the scans in order to know whether I should tread, obviously you need to tread carefully and we all have this dictum that the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is always dehiscent unless proven otherwise. And this is exactly what the scan shows. Now both are pathological scans and have been put here in order to help you appreciate the difference much better. As you can see, that's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve and that's the labyrinthine segment. And in spite of the pathology, here, the bony covering over the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is pretty well intact. Whereas on the co contemporary scan, what you see is, though the pathology is very, very limited, the operculum or the covering over the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is gone. So it's not necessarily true that the extent of the pathology would always decide whether the facial nerve would be dehiscent or not. Again, as is the dictum, if you have epitympanic attic cholesteatoma, always assume or presume that the facial nerve tympanic segment is dehiscent. Right. Of, we do often very, I mean, have uh, failures of our cavities, especially canal wall down or, for that matter, even canal wall up. And so, CT scan provides us with a, with a, with a decent idea as to whether my, the cavity that I had created, and if the patient is not having a dry ear, whether the cavity that I have created is a 
good cavity or a bad cavity. As you can see here, that's a, a, an ideal example of a good cavity. There is no bony overhang here. There's a wide concomiatoplasty, and the facial ridge has been lowered down to the, to the maximum possible extent. Whereas this is a classical example of a poor cavity. It's a narrow meatoplasty, there's a bony ledge, and look at the amount of bone that has still been left behind over the vertical part of the facial nerve, and hence leading to this sump effect. Again, you've done a mastoid, possibly a canal wall up mastoid, and you've put in a prosthesis, patient loses his hearing. You can always take the help of an HRCT to understand or to to sort of analyze whether your prosthesis is in place or not. As you can see in this particular scan, that's an old-fashioned uh, Teflon prosthesis, TORP, which has come out of its area along with some cholesterol granuloma. Canalplasty forms a very important part of our surgery, whether it's a tympanoplasty or a mastoid surgery, but what we have to realize is that the, the thinness of the tympanic bone, especially anteriorly, and its close proximity to the temporomandibular joint. If you drill the uh, tympanic bone to a large extent, you always have the chance of opening up the temporomandibular joint, which can A, lead to a temporomandibular joint arthritis in the long run, and two, because of repeated jaw movement, epidermis can get pinched into that sac and it can lead to an iatrogenic cholesterol. So always take a look at the thinness or the thickness of the tympanic bone when you're taking a look at the uh, HRCT of the temporal bone. So that is the iatrogenic cholesterol which the patient developed after undergoing a type 1 tympanoplasty with canalplasty. The burning issue, canal wall up or canal wall down, I don't need to get into that debate. But obviously for a canal wall up, besides second look surgery, we need to figure out a way wherein we can sort of understand whether uh, by scan, whether CT or MR, we do have a short discussion on that in the later part of this presentation, whether the CT or the MR can give us an idea about the recurrence. This obviously is a gross case of recurrence. That's the intact external auditory canal wall, and as you can see, there is formation of some kind of a soft tissue. Why I use the term some kind would get evident in the later part of the presentation. Piston failure, patient, you've done a stapy surgery, and the patient says, Dr. Saab, acha sun rahe te, achanak se chakar aa rahe, kam sun rahe hai. There's a movement, uh, there's a move, uh, component with movement, and you do an HRCT, and uh, you find the prosthesis. Uh, the, the piston out of its place. Obviously, the, uh, the shadow here is hyper intense because it's a fish prosthesis wherein the lower part is intentionally made a little radio opaque for us to understand the uh, piston better. Finally, the last part of the discussion, and that is the pathology. Now, the biggest disadvantage of CT is the poor soft tissue and neurovascular differentiation, irrespective of which area you're dealing with. Now, as an otologist, when you are ordered asking for an HRCT, especially if in a revision case, the things that you wish to see is whether there's an inflammatory change, whether there is serious fluid, pus, granulation, cholesterol, granuloma, or for that matter, cholesterol. But unfortunately, there is no differentiation, and they all appear similar, and that is an iso-intense shadow. So how do we go about it? Especially, in, as I was saying, it's a burning issue for canal wall up surgery because it's advocated that after a canal wall surgery, you do a second look surgery about eight to 10 months down the line and possibly even do an ossicular reconstruction. But is there a way by which we can try and avoid the second surgery? CT scan? No. MRI? Maybe. Now that's a patient, that's a uh, operatively proven patient. It's a young girl I had operated upon and I had done a canal wall up surgery. And within seven days of the surgery, the girl had a fall and somehow, uh, for whatever reason, anyway, she basically started having discharge again. And when I got an MRI done, that's a T2 scan, I saw, I saw a kind of a hyper intense shadow. And I explored her again, and obviously the cavity was full of cholesteatomatous mass. A few studies have been conducted by Jan Kasselmann of uh, Belgium and his friends, by Nagai and uh, by Stasola. In fact, I had the good fortune of meeting and interacting with Kasselmann when I was in Turkey for the International Polystoma Conference in 2008. And he is one person who has been really working on the fact that can we design a modality of scanning by which we can sort of pinpoint the fact that yes, this pathology is cholesteatoma. They made pretty decent progress so far according to their theory. The eco-planner or the non-eco-planner diffusion-weighted images 
if they are performed on a patient where you've done a canal wall up surgery or any other patient where you feel like sort of identifying the, the recurrence or the residual cholesteatoma, you do a non-EP or an EP, preferably a non-EP diffusion weighted image, and the cholesteatoma lights up on that particular image. It becomes hyper intense. It's a dirty looking image because diffusion weighted images are pretty dirty looking images, but the cholesteatoma lights up. A lot of studies have been conducted. You put in, you go to PubMed or you sort of go to, uh, go to any other of uh, these uh, medical uh, citation sites, and you put in Castleman or you put in EPI imaging and cholesteatoma, and you would get a number of hits. And it's an interesting theory. In fact, it's more than a theory now. It's being done very, very commonly. But what you have to ensure is that there are no artifacts, facts in the external auditory canal because basically that hyper intensity is because of the dead epidermis. So if you have a keratotic uh, lump in the external auditory canal, it would give out the same signals. Finally, last part of the discussion. CP angle tumors, internal auditory canal uh, tumors or SOLs, is CT mandatory? In my opinion, yes. And the next few, few slides would prove that to you. That's a CT scan of a patient. No point getting into the history. Absolutely normal CT. But look at the size of the vestibular schwannoma the patient is harboring. Second example, CT scan of another patient, the only abnormality that you see is that the sigmoid sinus is a little bulky, maybe because of hyperdynamic circulation, maybe because of anatomical alteration, but look at the kind of the, uh, CP angle tumor she is harboring. Third example, this patient presented to me with a sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss. I, I hope it's pretty uh, clear to uh, everyone here that a sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss on the right side. He had it in the morning. I saw him in the afternoon. His acoustic reflexes were all present. His acoustic reflexes were all present. His beira, right and left, was more or less normal. There was no delay. There was no increase in the inter-peak uh, latencies. None of that happened. Not only that, I put him on steroids and his hearing started improving. His hearing started improving. In fact, it became uh, sort of similar to the hearing on the left side, and we could always assume this to be the, the remnant or the base, baseline pressed by acoustics that he might be having. But, surprise, surprise, the patient for a change insisted on an MRI, and what we find is a small intracanalicular SOL, possibly a vestibular schwannoma. And let me give you the unfortunate news his tumor now is increasing in size. So, moral of the story, CP angle, or rather sensory neural hearing loss, or for that matter, any inner ear symptom, especially unilateral. Don't do a beira, don't, or rather don't stop at a beira, don't stop at an acoustic reflex, don't stop if the patient recovers his or her hearing. Please ensure that you do an MRI with GAT, and you ensure that uh, you rule out a CP angle tumor. Well, this might be an impossibility in my state, but I do assure, assume, I mean, I would definitely hope that radiologists and ENT specialists can come together and have a much more fruitful association. Just to end it on a much lighter note, two pieces of advice for all married men here. Never laugh at your wife's choices, you're one of them. And never be too proud of your choices, your wife is one of them. And before I end, a very, very heartfelt thanks to all my friends here, to the Bangalore ENT Association, to Raja Rajeshwari Medical College, to Avair Medicon, and particularly to Deepak Sir. Sir, I'm honored and grateful to have been uh, to be in contact with you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.